you'd be surprised at what people would leave behind nowadays. And you'd be even more surprised at how much you can make off people's negligence. I make some extra money by purchasing abandoned storage units and flipping the contents inside. Most of the time, you'll find trash like old clothes and busted furniture. But every now and then, there'll be some treasures. Just the other month, I found a box full of old Pokemon cards, and you won't believe how much some of those can go for. As with this whole COVID stuff going on, a lot of storage units have been left abandoned. I went over to another city about an hour away to check out a few units. I'm good friends with the owner of this really old lot, a short plump fellow named Mark, who took over the family business, and he sometimes gives me a heads up when some are available. So I hopped into my truck early one Saturday and made my way over. I met Mark near the entrance and I followed him towards a small group of people standing in front of one of the units. Now, I'm sure you've seen some shows on TV about stuff like this, and to be honest, it's pretty accurate. About five other people are outside of the steel garage door. It's early, we're freezing our asses off, and we're trying to make a quick buck. Mark pops the lock and rolls the door open to reveal what's inside. We're all able to examine the unit from the outside. We can't touch anything unless we buy it. This unit has some cardboard boxes, some decent looking wooden chairs, and a few plastic bags that were completely stuffed. We all quickly glance inside and think if we want to actually bid on this thing or not. My gut was telling me that this was probably going to be a dud, so I passed on it. The next unit had a few good looking golf clubs that I could fetch for a good price, but that wasn't what I was looking for. I could more units, and I was thinking I probably wasted my morning driving up there. Until we got to the very last unit. When Mark opened up the unit, a blast of dust and stale air bursted out. We all glanced inside. There were a few things that caught my eye, like some old dolls, an old wooden table with chairs, and a huge armoire cabinet. Bingo. That was what got me. A massive thing like that probably held all sorts of stuff. I'll spare you the details of how the bid went with a back and forth of offers. I can assure you that I got the unit and all for $400. I was sure I could make my money back and then some. It was around noon when I left the group to check out the unit I'd bought. I opened the doors and started to sift through the small stuff before hitting the bigger things. There were a few things like some plates and silverware that could sell pretty well, a bag full of really old business suits, and some broken appliances. So far, it wasn't a huge loss, but my eyes were on the armoire. It was a beautiful piece that stood over six and a half feet tall. It was dark brown, like looking into a forest as the sun went down. It was made of what looked like different types of wood. This was a good sign. It means that this was definitely an antique. There were no signs of any manufacturer label. This was probably handmade. Definitely handmade, with very minor asymmetrical points. I placed my hands on the handles of the door. And pulled. My heart was racing with anticipation. The wood groaned lightly as I opened the armoire doors, like someone awakening from a deep slumber. I looked inside to find a rack with a long sheer white dress inside. I carefully unhooked it, examining the condition that it was in. It was a lovely dress that would have accentuated a stunning woman. I placed it back where it came from and began to rummage through the drawers. The top drawer was empty. My chest tightened as I thought of the money I probably lost on this unit. Opening the drawer felt like opening the lid to a crypt. I had to use a little more strength to remove it from its holding jackpot. Inside of the drawer was an ornate wooden jewellery box. Oh, it was a beautiful thing to behold. It was a little bit bigger than a shoebox, with an intricate carving of a field of flowers on top of it. On the side of the jewellery box, there were more carvings of small rabbits playing on a field of flowers. I know it sounds a little bit silly, but the craftsmanship was truly astounding. Such detail in the animals made them look so lifelike. I lifted the box out ever so carefully from the drawer 
and placed it on a tarp that I had placed earlier. It was unlocked, so I slowly opened its lid to find a diamond ring affixed to a gleaming golden band. You know how in cartoons when a character opens that treasure and they are covered in an angelic light? That's exactly how it seemed to me. I jumped up and let out a, yes! This ring could easily sell for thousands. After a few minutes of patting myself on the back, I realized that that was just the tip of the iceberg. There was more to the jewelry box. I calmed myself and began to open the rest of its doors and panels. I admit, I was a little bit disappointed when I couldn't find anything. I was being a bit greedy. I lifted the box again to examine it closer. That's when I noticed the top part where the jewelry was held was raised a bit. I set my fingernails along the edges of the inside of the box and I was able to lift the part where the jewelry was held. Inside was a secret compartment with a single cassette inside. I laughed a bit as I grabbed the cassette out from the box. I see antiques all the time, but whenever I see audio cassettes, I'm surprised every single time. It's just so obsolete. At least the old jewelry box and cabinet can still be used. A glint of metal shone in the corner of my eye. Underneath the cassette was a pale silver wedding band. My lucky day. I put it to the side and continued to go through the rest of the unit. It wasn't a bad haul at all with the rings. Some vintage looking business suits, the white dress and the furniture. I was definitely going to be in the positive after selling all of this stuff. I was able to get Mark to come down and help me haul the important stuff into boxes and packed onto the bed of my truck with the promise of a few beers later. Unfortunately, the armoire was way too big for my truck, so I'd have to come back for it. I had spent a few hours that day dealing with the unit, and it was already late in the afternoon. Before I headed out, I thought I'd take a moment to listen to that cassette on my way home. I asked Mark if he would happen to have a cassette player lying around somewhere. He grinned, and sure enough, he had a few stowed away. Quote, just in case. I wish I could have been more appreciative, but he charged me 15 bucks for one. Convenience fee, he said with a cheeky smile. Asshole. I hopped into my truck and made my way back home, thinking about my contacts that could assist in flipping this stuff. While I was at a stoplight, I popped the cassette into the player, making sure it was rewound, and pressed play. The tape began to whir and clicked to play. I couldn't hear a thing. Maybe it was just an empty tape. Eventually, my brain switched to autopilot and my body began to go through the motion of driving itself home, my mind completely blanking out. That was when I started to hear something. It was a faint whisper right behind my skull. The voice was so light that it was almost drowned out by the sound of my truck's engine. Drive off. I kept my eyes on the road and felt my hands ever so slightly veer to the right. My truck took a dip as it began to go off the road and onto the grass and dirt. I let out a surprised gasp as I quickly straightened the wheel back towards the road. My shoulders stiffened and a bead of sweat rolled down my forehead. What the hell was that? I slowed down and pulled safely onto the side of the road. I opened the car door and... When did it get so dark? I looked at my phone to see that the hour drive home had turned to three. Where the hell am I? I took a moment to gather myself and to make sure everything was okay in the bed of my truck. I sat back down onto the driver's seat and pulled up the GPS on my phone. Not only did I not head home, I turned around in the opposite direction. I squeezed the bridge of my nose and rubbed my temples. I thought that I was just tired or something. Yeah, just tired from a long day. I turned the keys in the ignition and my truck cranked to life. I set the directions onto my phone and continued my attempt to return home. I felt my stomach twist inside of me. I hadn't eaten anything all day. I wanted to hurry and get home already. The roads were completely empty, so I stepped on the gas a bit 
accelerating in a desperate attempt to shorten the trip. I stared forward, and that was when I heard that something again. I held my breath so I could focus on the noise. Faster. Faster. It was as if an icy dagger had run down my spine as I heard those words. It sounded like a young woman's voice, but in so much pain, so much sadness in her tone. I tried to lift my feet off the gas pedal. I wanted to slow down and be more careful after hearing that. Maybe it was just some intrusive thoughts popping into my skull. My brain tried to tell me to ease up on the gas, but I couldn't. My feet began to sink lower onto the pedal. 65, 72, 78. The number on my speedometer was climbing higher and higher. I couldn't move my foot off the gas. 83, 88, 94. My truck's engine was revving up. The sound of it was blaring in my ears. The boxes in the bed of my truck began to shift and move around. I glanced into my rearview mirror to see one of the boxes. The top flaps of it were beginning to move up. All the boxes were securely taped down, but something inside of it was pushing its way out. That was when the top of the box flew open, and all I could do was stare with my jaw dropped to the floor as something grabbed a hold of the edge of the box to lift itself out. 98, 102, 107. The shape was illuminated by dim beams of moonlight. I saw thin fingers, white and long, on the edge of the box. The head came next, black, tussled hair that hung down forever. The neck was shown next, deep and purple grooves indented into pale grey skin as if a snake had wrapped itself around them. Then the torso came to reveal a beautiful sheer white dress that fit tightly on her figure to show every line and curve that she had. The same dress I had found and packed up inside of that box. The woman stood up. My truck was going faster and faster, but she stood impossibly still aside from her hair that was now flowing behind her. When I saw her face, that was when I lost it. I wanted to cry, scream and vomit all at the same time. Her face was a deep purple and swollen and the skin was cracked, tearing. Her eyes were completely red, with one of her eyes hanging by a fleshy thread out of its socket while the other one throbbed. Dark brown bile was running down the corners of her mouth and onto the white dress. Die. 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 Those words came out clear as day. I looked back onto the road and I could feel myself slowly lose control of the steering wheel. I continued to try and lift my foot from the pedal, but it was as if it sprouted claws and was digging itself into my foot. I couldn't do anything. All I could do was keep my damn wheel steady on the road. I turned back to look to my rearview mirror and the woman was gone. I was fully convinced I was going crazy. Then those thoughts shifted to the idea of me dying as I heard something thump above me. I looked forward again to see those fingers on the edge of my glass. She was clambering above me. Her face upside down was now peering at me, her mouth open and those words croaked out of a crushed throat. Die, die, die. The dark brown fluid was pouring out of her mouth and onto my glass, obscuring any other vision I had. Spiderwebbed cracks began to form in front of me. This thing was smashing its head to get to me. A noise finally came out of my mouth, a mix of fear and awe. Moments later, her head came crashing in as her mouth clenched under the steering wheel. I felt the car jerk towards the right, and I felt an impact. I braced myself for death. Then, the airbag deployed and smashed into my face. It all happened so damn fast. I groggily opened my eyes, and my body was aching. I coughed, and it made my head feel like it was going to burst. That was when I noticed my truck was completely flipped over, and I was upside down. The blood that rushed to my head made me feel nauseous. I snapped back to reality as my eyes began to frantically dart around. Where did that woman go? The night was dead silent. I tried to free myself, but I was too weak. 
a click noise echoed throughout the air beside me, and I looked over towards the cassette player. I don't know why, but as I looked at the cassette rolling inside the clear plastic panel, I felt sadness and fear like it was the end of the world. A man's voice emerged from the player. It was smooth and deep and almost comforting. Hey bunny, sorry it's been so long. Work's been really laying into me lately, but I promise I'll make it up to you. Just let me know and I'll get you whatever you want, okay? I'm sorry about the way I acted the other night. I hope you can forgive me. It's just you were questioning me every damn day with where am I going and who was I with? <sighs> Look, let's just let this fall under the bridge, alright? I'll be home tomorrow night. I love you, bunny. As soon as the machine clicked off, well, it was lights out for me too, apparently. The rest of the events are broken in my head. Fragments of memories, like someone on the phone, an ambulance coming, my body on a stiff bed, to me lying in the hospital, all wrapped up like a mummy. The first things that came out of my mouth were food and where's my stuff? The things that came from the unit were still intact and were in safe keeping. Some time had passed and I can still see that woman wherever I go, creeping around corners behind me in the reflection and at the foot of my bed. I hadn't told a soul about what happened that night until it was brought up by my therapist. Yeah, I was still fully convinced that I had some kind of breakdown until he finally got me to talk about it. It was just so vivid. The woman, her face, her scarred throat. I finally pulled out the cassette player and played the audio again to hear that man's voice. So, I did some digging. It took a while, but I finally had a lead. Surprisingly, Bunny is not an uncommon name like you would think, so that was a bust. Then I remembered Mark. A few drinks in and he, um, let me into his files to look up records on who owned the unit last. So one thing led to another, and I found her name, Martha Bailey. That name eventually led to an address. As soon as I got my info, I gathered the rings, the dress, the cassette, and the jewelry box, and headed over as quickly as possible. I followed the GPS towards my destination, and I wanted to cry as fear washed over my body. Even though it was daylight now, I realised I was passing the area where I had crashed. Was I being led back to this address that night? An hour or so had passed, and I parked in front of an old house that was probably built in the 70s. I grabbed the stuff and hurriedly ran to the front door. I didn't know what I was expecting. I just felt like I had to be here or something. I knocked on the door with my arms full of stuff, looking like a lunatic. The door slowly creaked open, and through a crack, I could see inside the home was an elderly woman. She looked at me with wide eyes. I couldn't blame her. She asked me what I was doing, so I explained to her a bit of what happened. I bought a unit recently. There were some things in there that I thought would be valuable to Martha Bailey. When she saw what I was holding, I saw a lip quiver and a tear roll down her face. She told me that her mother owned that unit, but dropped off those things because they belonged to her sister, and she didn't dare part with them. Her frail hand clutched at her chest as she stood there and told me what happened to her sister, Barbara Bailey, aka Bunny. She was married to a man who said he loved her and would give her anything she wanted. On the outside, you'd think they were the perfect couple, but that was far from the truth. Apparently, the man had been abusive, cheated on her every chance he would get. Well, she finally confronted him about it, but he was mostly unfazed. He had money, lots of it, and if he were to leave, she would be left with absolutely nothing aside from embarrassment and heartbreak. So Barbara, Bunny, she took it upon herself to end things one night. The man was on his way home to patch things up, like he normally did. But she had enough. She wrapped a rope around her neck. The old woman burst into tears as she slammed the door in my face. 
I could hear a wails of pain beyond the threshold of the piece of wood between us. I didn't know what else to do. So, I went back to the unit and dropped the stuff back. Everything back to where it was. And slammed. The garage door shut. <laughs> 